to experience that as fully as he could. But I think from now on, Samson's going to find it easier to visualize things and easier to go into a visionary state. Now, if you come to my class tonight, we're going to do a bunch of practical exercises. Uh, Christian wants me to do one or two here, so we will. But I'm, but I'm going to. Uh, there'll be more in the one in the one this evening. But I want to take a step back and go back to the beginning of of where I was uh, in magic, and sort of tell you my story. Um, so there I am. I'm like a, a. It's hard for me to remember the exact dates of these things, but I was 13 or 14 years old. We didn't have the internet, and I didn't keep notes of things all that well when I was a teenager. Um, and I was super interested in conducting magic, uh, and so I did. I did some spells for my friends, and they always they always worked out. Like it was mostly love spells, and they always got the person that they wanted to go with. Um, and it always worked out. Um, I was very surprised that how well it actually functioned. And so, I I'm a big believer in the practical um, power of of doing ritual. I'm not a huge believer in. Uh, that there's one right way of doing things. I think that there that there's in this community there's been way too much lately emphasis upon doing things of, like in really specific ways that that is going to produce better results. I find in my in my life when I when I do really high sort of high Episcopalian Golden Dawn style um, talisman operations and stuff. I've done them about six times in my life, and those were some of my least effective magical rituals, honestly. <laughs> Just because there's so much, there's so much other stuff, there's so many holes in the, in the process. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That any time that you're losing focus on one area, you're kind of, and there's so many parts to it. That, it, that honestly just sort of like taking something and putting some energy into it and you know calling upon the powers and just doing it, that's it's been so much more effective for, for me over and over again throughout my magical career. Um, so when I was first getting started though, I, I was in a youth group in a, in a Unitarian Universalist church and I decided that we were having a sleepover and I decided that since we were doing that we should do an evocation of Lucifer. Um, and <laughs> for some reason, the, uh, whoever the supervisor was uh, accepted that proposal. Um, so we, like, we, we took chalk and we made a big circle and we all went inside the circle and um, we lit a bunch of candles. And I feel like the ritual that I was doing was somehow, it was connected to the ritual that you would see in the book of Black Magic and Pacts or the Ceremonial Magic by A.D. E. Wade. I'd like taken different pieces of different parts of that and concocted a ritual together. That was another one that was early on in my, in my collection. Um, and we, we, did the, we, we lit the incense for the ritual and we, and we were calling and I was calling and I was getting frustrated because it didn't seem like, it, like everyone was focusing as much as they could. And then finally the focus became really intense and we were really at sort of like the height of this experience and everyone was kind of getting, like starting to get anticipation and all of a sudden, and we basically, because it was a church, that, that uh, it was connected directly to the fire department. So, you know, and we're right across the street from the fire department. So really fast, there were, there were firemen there and we had this weird circle. It was very, very uncomfortable, for, I'm sure, for the grown up in the room to explain. Um, so, so that was my first group ritual. Um, I'd, I'd done a couple of other rituals with one other person. But that was the first time I ever gathered together as a group. And I, and I remember thinking at that time, and it's funny because we were talking about um, earlier about groups, uh, you know, starting groups. I remember thinking groups kind of suck in a way because, you know, no offense, <laughs> um, but I mean the concept of group kind of sucks because um, it's hard to get everyone into the same accord. Now I've learned some stuff for improving that, like just sort of doing something simple like saying some ohms or breathing together at the beginning really helps to focus things all in the same place, but if you, if you don't have that built in, it's people's energies are stuck kind of all over the place, which is one of the reasons I've sort of stayed away from it, probably unconsciously, is just that those early experiences with, with those people. But um, the, the next thing that I did was with a, a friend of mine, and we took that book of black magic, and we actually, we were doing some other spells from it with just nothing going on whatsoever, and all these pictures on the walls started 
shifting and, and, and I was like, what, what? And, and nothing ever happened to it other than that, but, but just stuff was moving around in the room and I thought, wow, this is really crazy. And I, and I, I don't think I've really had that dramatic of a reaction to so little effort <laughs> since then, but, but I mean, there, there, were a, there was a lot of phenomena taking place. And I think that it partially was the guy I was working with because he seemed to have, that was something that he had around him a lot. Whenever he was doing stuff, phenomena would happen. Um, that didn't happen on my own. Um, but what I noticed at that point was that when, when we would work together and do a ritual, if he was doing it and I was seeing, I would see things quite well. Um, if I was on my own, I didn't see things as well. And for a long time, I was under the belief that either he was the cause of it or that somehow group dynamics was the cause of it, I didn't realize until much later that it's actually just the structure of when you create a feedback loop through speaking, you actually see things much clearer than otherwise. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about tonight in the class. We could do a little bit of it here probably too. Do it too. An uneven number, so we'd have to, I'd have to participate if we do that. But, um, so, I abandoned my quest for a couple of years towards the end of high school just because I was really involved in the drama club and I was really getting girlfriends and stuff and so I just really didn't focus on it all that much. But then I sort of picked it up a couple of years later and um, was really interested in doing the Abra Malin operation. That was something that was very important to me and um, really interested in uh, the sort of practical aspect of magic that I felt like I'd had some success with. Those were, and those were, the, those were the two things. And those kind of have become, you know, if you, if you look at my, the body of work that I've created, those are really the, the main focus of almost everything that I do. Um, it's funny to think about that, because I, I didn't really think about that until just now. Um, the, Jason, for our junior people, can you just give a sentence or two on what the Abra Millen working oh, sure, is yeah. and what it does? Uh, okay, so basically, um, I mean, there's, there's a couple different versions of how we can talk about the Abra Millen operation, but the condensed version is that it's a... It's a, it's, a, it's a ritual that's performed over a long period of time in order to connect you with your own holy guardian angels in the book, or angel in the way that we mostly look at it today, um, that will bring to you magical powers to accomplish all sorts of amazing things. Um, and, it, and in fact, it has a series of, they're not quite talismans in the back, but a series of, of like squares of letters that are, each one has a, a, a magical power attached to it, like you can cause earthquakes, and you can make the woman fall in love with whomever you want, you can turn people into toadstools, all that sort of really dramatic magical effects are, are part of that book. Now what's interesting about it is that we've come to, and, and they're, they're all very incomplete in the version that, that I had when I was growing up, the squares, the magical squares, some of them just had a few cues in them and nothing else. Some of them had like a couple lines of stuff and a few of them were completely filled out. Well, it turned out there's a guy, a, a, a George Dane, who has done a, a, a new translation of the book, which has modified some other stuff as well, but it also gives the complete squares for every single one. And I remember there was all this sort of, you know, modern folklore about why it was important that the squares weren't completed. Like some people said, oh, the angels are supposed to complete them for you. Or some people said that, you know, this is, the, you know, the, the magic is in their lack of, of formation. I've heard all kinds of stories about them. Well, it turns out it's not true. They just weren't whoever, wherever, wherever Mathers got his, uh, <laughs> his, his version of it, the person hadn't bothered to really finish the squares. And that's, that's what it was. But so if you purchase George Dane's book, you can see what the, at least one version of what those squares were actually meant to look like. Um, is that enough about Auburn Allen or, you know, just for the moment, we can come back to it. Um, so, uh, I, I joined um, a, an organization called the Ordo Templi Orientis and uh, there's still a, lot, a, a, a group here mm -hmm. in Salem. Um, maybe a few of them will show up tonight, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and I actually became the leader of that group after a few years, and we did a lot of work with Enochian. Um, do you guys know what Enochian is? Is that a familiar concept, this, this group? Um, we used largely uh, Lon Milo Duquette's uh, small Enochian book called uh, the, the Enochian World of Aleister Crowley, Enochian Sex Magic, which the book has nothing to do with sex magic, it's a little tiny thing at the end. Um, 
uh, and we, we got some interesting results from that, although not, I, I would say in many ways, Enochian at that point was a little bit of a disappointment to me because um, both through the Schuler's book, which I'd done some practical work out of battle, but that really has very little to do with Enochian, um, uh, and, and just through rumors that I heard, Enochian was supposed to be the most powerful form, you know, people were saying, oh, it's so powerful and dangerous, you can destroy yourself. Interesting, also, the Auburn Mainland operation was, was the same thing was said about that at that time. So, um, apparently I'm attracted to the things that are supposedly dangerous and <laughs> not safe to work with. But, so, we, we, we did a working group and we worked for a long time on it. Um, and we would switch up the rules that we were taking and some people would have interesting visions and we would talk to various entities and some of them would give us accurate information and some of us would give, some of them would give us inaccurate information and some of the people really lacked the skills at visualization to <laughs> to get much other than just I'm seeing sort of like a gray shape or something like that but again that was largely because of their confidence but it taught me a number of things about about um, the dynamics of, of uh, doing uh, visionary magic as a group, and I think that was really the start of where I started going. Okay, look, maybe we can turn this. I can turn this into like a science that we can, you know, figure out how to how to get people to to be able to visualize this stuff more easily. Um, then uh, I decided to do the Aubrey-Malin operation and um, spent several months uh, engrossed in that process. And out of that came my first book that got published called Twenty First Century Mage. Um, that's not actually the name that I came up with for the book. It was going to be called um, Your Holy Guardian Angel, uh, you know, the Auburn Mailing Operation, I the Modern World. It looks like a tide cover. Yes, it looks like a box of yeah, tides. Yeah. Um, well, what, what ended up happening is that um, Weiser Books was owned by Donald Weiser when I got my contract for that book. And, um, you know, he, he, he vetted me through Lon Mile Duquette and they decided they were going to publish it, and then before he got very far in the process, he sold the company to uh, Red Wheel. And so Red Wheel Watt came in, and they had a whole, they were, you know, if you guys have seen what they normally offer, it's more like gifty books, a little bit new agey kind of stuff here and there, but it's not really an occult publisher, which Wiser at that time was very, very much a you know, they were publishing all the books that I've mentioned, except for the Schuler books, and you know that they were they were your occult publishing company. Um, there's now a bunch of little ones that have that have grown up, but at that time that was like them and Aquarian um, were the were the most sort of serious occult book creators, uh, and then Llewellyn had a bunch of fluff. And I actually think Llewellyn's kind of gone the other way around. They've they've become more serious and. Uh, yeah, you don't yeah. agree? No, I agree with that. I think they're, they're titles, and I think it's because there was a drought of right. created that the serious authors migrated right. over to the Well, and, and the truth of the matter is, and I wish that I'd gone with Llewellyn, that their, their reach is so much wider, too. So why would you, why would you want to be with anybody else? Um, I didn't realize that at the time, and I went with, you know, who, uh, Wiser was all the books I liked. Were, had, you know, when I looked at my library, it was all... It was all books uh, ever were Wiser books. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Wiser cared more. Yeah, uh, but that's not necessarily true with the reading public. That's just true with us hardcore yeah. occultists. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so uh, I mean, if you go to like Barnes and Noble, the books that you'll see there all are have little moons on them. Um, yeah. If you go to Seven Stars, a lot more of them have the the og on them. So, um, so I, I got this publishing contract, and I was really excited. I was very disappointed when I found out what my world my uh, advance was going to be. I've, I've been thinking in my mind, I'm going to go take a trip to Europe and just relax for a while. And then I found out what I was actually getting paid. And I was like, oh, I can pay my phone bill off her money. <laughs> um, come on. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, it, they never got in contact with me. I got signed the contract, I got my little check, I put it in the bank, and I never heard from them for the longest time. And it's because I think the, com the company just went into turmoil because Donald Weiser sold it. And, um, I moved to Los Angeles, and one day I just opened up my my mail, and there was a big envelope in there with the, with the Wiser catalog in it. I think the cover, the 21st Century Mage cover, was on the cover of the catalog, and they said, "Hi, Jason. Just wanted to let you know we're excited. Your book's coming out, that, you know, in a couple months, and um, we we've changed the title. We've rearranged the order a little bit. You just have to like approve the final 
uh, draft that we've done and we're ready to go forward. And I was like, I was I was really broken up about it, you know, because I mean, the, the box is tied and the 21st century mage. I mean, I didn't hate 21st century mage until a few months later when uh, one of my a friend of mine from high school was like, oh, it's really great that you got a book called, it's fantastic. What exactly is 21st century McGee about? And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Obviously, you know, that word, mage, it, maybe it's a commonplace for you guys, but I mean, the your, uh, Joe Public, unless they play like uh, video games or, or yeah. card games or something, they've never heard that word. It doesn't, it means nothing. So they've, they've taken 21st century, which is already kind of a trite, you know, especially since it was like 19, I think it was, it was the, the 21st century had just begun when, when you know, that book came. So they take 21st century, which is trite, and then attach it to a word that means nothing. 21st century, nothing. <laughs> you know, like it's just, <laughs> so it, I eventually told them that I wanted them to put a subtitle on it of some sort, so more modern printings of it actually have, it's not even, it's not even right though, I think it's something like a modern reinterpretation of the Abramelin ritual or something like that, and it's just like, really, have you not looked at the book at all in order to proceed? So, I mean, I wanted to, to mention the knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel, which was a very meaningful phrase to me at that time because of um, the Thelema, you know, Golden Dawn AA stuff. That, um, so, that book didn't do that well. <laughs> and and, and uh, about that same time that I was doing the Abramelin operation, I was really getting interested in neuro-linguistic programming. Are you guys familiar with that? What that is? Richard Bandler. Richard Bandler, John Grinder. They, they were these guys in the '70s, part of the sort of personal development, uh, human potential movement. Um, created this thing called neuro-linguistic programming, which kind of combines hypnosis, um, like we were doing with him, and uh, studying human success models through sensory perceptions. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. Not all of it really works as well as they would like to pretend that it does, but a lot of it does, and it's a, it's about sort of looking at what you're experiencing in perception and adjusting that to to get a result that someone else gets by doing that same thing. So in other words, if you if you discover that the that the best um, the best occult seer before he um, begins a vision. He, you know, imagines a, a, a tiny dot and opens it up. If you try that and you discover that it works, then you've modeled what he's doing and increased your own success that way. Um, so, I was, so I was like, oh, this, I got to start applying this to occult stuff. So I started modeling, you know, astral projection. I started modeling visionary magic. I started modeling all the different things that, that I thought were interesting in occultism that some people could do better than others and started developing some models for it. And then I, and then I started trying to model the whole initiatory process. Um, uh, it's a very arrogant thing to do, but, I, but that's what I did. Um, and uh, that's how the New Hermetics came out, was through those models, uh, the, that modeling activity is where the, the New Hermetics sort of came from. And uh, that was a little more successful than the 21st century mage. You know, still, people still get in touch with me to this day and say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in it. And I sort of made that this kind of the center of my, uh, my, my work, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, although it has shifted over time, when I first, when the book first came out, well, okay, so I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but um, the when when the, the new hermetics, what I saw in my community, which was mostly the OTO um, at that time, uh, yeah, I would say there was there was really no one else that I was really interacting with on a regular basis. I noticed that everyone was doing things like they would do the star ruby, which is the Thalamic version of the lesser vanishing ritual of the pentagram, and then some people would do the lesser vanishing ritual of the pentagram. Um, but that was pretty much their whole magical practice was just doing that, and there was nothing else in their in their magical practice other than going to initiation rituals and stuff like that. And I would, and I thought to myself, well, there's so much more that you could be doing to sort of develop yourself as a human being rather than just simply doing one ritual every single day, right? Um, and so. The New Hermetics, I thought, okay, so let's take the initiatory process <laughs> that someone goes through over a long period of time and turn them into some tools that a person can use at any time 
and sort of be able to more quickly go through the basic things to develop sort of your, your visionary space, to develop your ability to connect with things actually, develop your ability to, um, to move energy in your body, develop your ability to kind of create thought forms and do stuff. What if, we can, what if I create that into something that someone can do in, say, six months, and then they can spend the rest of their time doing practical things with those things rather than constantly working on the same simple developmental exercises forever? Well, I wrote the book, and I started a Yahoo group to discuss it, because uh, that was big at that time, <laughs> that dates it. Um, uh, and a bunch of people joined, and they all kept talking about how they were doing the New Hermetics grounding and centering ritual, and that was all they were doing. Um, and that's basically the New Hermetics version of the Lesser Vanishing Ritual of the Pentagram. So I was like, um, okay, so, so here I've, I've created all this stuff to make it easier for people to do more, and they're still staying right with that first foundational exercise. So I was like, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a program, I'm not going to charge very much money for it, I'm just going to create a little thing where I will supervise people in doing this. And I supervised a bunch, and I, I, I got a bunch of people to go through it, and um, some people finished, some people didn't. Um, and I, I think there's there's about 10 people who are advanced adepts in New Hermetics officially through, through being supervised by me. Um, uh, but I, I just, as I was saying to Christian, I just kind of grew tired of it all. It was taking me way too much of my time. And the natural predilection of everybody was just to, just to do the, <laughs> the, the vanishing ritual of the pentagram. And I'm not going to stop people from doing that anymore. Um, <laughs> that's what people want to do. That's what they want to do. Um, but so the New Hermetics itself, if you want to walk away from here with some, with some you know, insight <laughs> from, from me, uh, you, you, can, you can approach any part of it and do it. it doesn't, you don't have to have done the other parts, although I recommend you know, working on getting yourself to the point where you can sort of you know, move your energy around and, and, and visualize things. And then, then it's all open at that point. Once, you, you know, once, you're, once you're feeling the ability to, to, to uh, control things in yourself, you're, you have all the power that you need, and you're not going to really have any more power than that ever, no matter what, no matter how much you'd like to believe that, that something else is true. It's simply not. You know, we're, we're, um, I, I think it's interesting how there's this uh, modern grimoire movement that's going on right now, um, where people are basically claiming that if you just follow the instructions exactly as they are written in the grimoires that are a few hundred years old, you're going to get results that are different than if you don't. And have any, have any of you guys participated in any of that? So I know you guys are more in the, this, this uh, lodge type work, but um, it simply isn't the case. And, and, you can, and you can just very logically prove it to yourself just by looking at the lives of the people who are making those claims, which are no different than any of our other lives. You know, everyone, everyone has great things happen in their lives and crappy things happen in their lives. Everyone, sometimes people you know, will have a, have a run of great luck in their lives and things will just be flowing and flowing and flowing and sometimes that ends. And, and what, our, our rituals can push those things a little bit. They can, they can, we can take control to a certain extent of the flow of things, especially if it's already flowing that way. You know, it's very hard if you're, if you're like, you know, wanting to, to make something happen that just there's no precedent for. That's very hard to accomplish. But if things are sort of already flowing that way, you can influence them and make it flow that way well. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of that kind of magical work. Um, and it's, it's done wonders in my life and for, the, for people that I've worked with. Um, but I don't think that if I were to have a, a belt made out of lion skin that I wore before I began that process, that, that it would honestly make any real difference in the situation. I don't think that I could then just take things and just, you know, all of a sudden amazing things that are impossible would be, would be happening in any kind of different way than, than they would happen otherwise. So um, let's do this. Now this is an interesting room. Because usually when I do this in a room, it's a less magical room than this. This room already has a lot of magical feeling in it, both for you guys and I think just inherently from both its structure and uh, the work that has been put in here for a long time. But so um, let's do a little practical exercise and then, and then we'll come back into my narrative of um, where I've been going. But I want to, and it's very simple. I want you guys to uh, just hold your hands out like this. 
And I want you to just feel what you feel in the room right now. With your hands and with your hearts and your heads and your feet, the whole essence of you. And that's the psychic temperature in this room right now. Set your hands down. Okay, so that's that's the way the room is right now. Now, like I said, there's been some magic going on in this room. So chances are, if you're like me, it already feels a little bit magical in here to begin with. Um, but I'm wondering if we can if we can raise that energy level just really in a simple way. Um, if we just close our eyes. Now, do you guys like to use ohms? Is that something that you guys feel comfortable with? Do you guys use them in your in your practice regularly or no? Depends. That's fine. Because um, we can just do ah uh, or no, ohm. Oh, or oh. Yeah, ohm. Everyone feels comfortable. Yeah. I don't want to. I know that you, you know different people. Some people are like ohm. That's a cool. bunch of that's a bunch of <laughs> Indian <laughs> stuff. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope. Otherwise, it's yeah. rough room. Um, <laughs> um, Go ahead and just relax a little bit. And I want you to visualize above your head that there is a globe of light that connects with uh, the highest aspect of your being and the highest aspect of all of our being. Just let that light radiate. Now, it may seem very bright, or it may just get brighter over time as we're working with it, but I want you to allow that light to begin to flow down into your head, your neck, your chest, down all the way to your feet. Just let that light just flow through you. Just experience that light beginning to fill every pore of your being. Then imagine that light continuing to pour, but also beginning to pool in the area of your heart so that it's all being concentrated into a, into a tremendous ball of glowing energy. And I want you to take a breath in with me and let that breath Invigorate that light, and as you exhale, I want you to chant Om, and as you chant Om, Om, I want you to begin to express that light energy out into the atmosphere in this room, so that it is coming in from above, filling your body, getting condensed in your heart, and then being expressed as we say Om. Now take a big breath in, and Om.
not only is there more of an energy of magic in there, but there's also more of a sense of connection between all of us. And so, go ahead and let, set your hands down, and I want you to gently open your eyes, feeling that sense of magic remaining in the room, so that we can feel quite pleasant and good about how we've changed the room. And now the room even looks a little bit different to me. I don't know if it does to you guys. Um, and so that is an incredibly simplistic and non-ornate um, <laughs> ritual action, but we can sense the magic or the, the transformation that's possible in there, right? Is there anyone who doesn't feel that way? It's more energy. Yeah. Energy. Energy. Yeah. 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 And, you know, connecting with different kinds of intelligence, whether we're talking about planetary angels. Do you guys work with, is it planetary angels that you guys work with? Or, or sephirotic? Or, it's you know? sephirotic. Yeah. Person. Yeah. Um, in connecting with those things, Essentially, all we're doing is we're raising our sort of vibratory level or shifting it to, the, to where that energy is, right? I mean, and, and so that can be done um, through a number of different ways. Like, the, the most traditional way is simply by devoting ourselves to it for a long period of time and really working at it. Um, what, what I discovered is that realistically, that angelic energy is a set of concepts. Now, all of us have slightly different concepts for those things, um, but if we can if we can establish connection with those concepts in our consciousness, we can basically establish a consistent gateway to entering into those energies. Um, and one of the reasons that I created my uh, my elemental and planetary incense is because I realized that the olfactory sense is one of the most powerful ways of connecting with our memories, with our, with our, uh, when I, when I burn my Abra Malin incense or my, you know, my, my spirit incense, it instantly brings me back to the time that I spent, you know, every day going and doing my, um, uh, my devotional Abra Malin work instantly. I mean, in a, in a, in an incredibly powerful way. And so, by having, now you don't have to use my incense, but by having like a consistent sort of olfactory component to what you're doing, you, you, it's, it, it creates a so much more powerful experience. Additionally to that, I've also created, and Christian I think has, has some of this stuff for sure, um, uh, an auditory component of, of uh, connecting with these energies. So I've created a bunch of recordings um, that basically contain uh, a specific frequency for each, uh, and, I, and I, I'm pretty sure I stick pretty closely to Paul Foster Case, to be honest with you, uh, which I know is your guys' is, because uh, he seemed to be the most, um, the most, there are other versions of it, but his seemed to fit the most smoothly with, uh, m with the way that I like to look at things, so. Um, he's got more tones than I use because he has all that semitones and stuff included in it, and I'm just basically stuck with it. Uh, he was an accomplished violinist, I believe. Is that right? And, uh, he was an accomplished um, uh, clarinet. He oh, played clarinet. clarinet. Oh. Okay. Yeah, he was a, kind of a big band composer. Kind of so he was clarinet, and clarinet yeah. in particular. I mean, the, the woodwind instruments are, are yeah. so powerful for creating that vibratory um, energy. Uh, so my, uh, my recordings, I, I've actually used um, uh, technology to create binaural beats that, that are at specific frequencies for the, uh, the different energies, the elemental and planetary. So, and what I've recently done, and I don't think I've ever said this publicly, although I've said it on my list a little bit, I've tried to, I've, it's hard to get it across because it's so cool. Um, uh, I, I, over the past um, 17 years or so, I have been making recordings, um, and, I, and I began after my NLP, after I created New Hermetics, I started, or we were sort of in the midst of that, I should say. It's, it all kind of happened at the same time. Um, I started creating self-hypnosis recordings, because uh, I took a, a hypnotherapy course, and I started creating recordings and selling them on eBay and stuff. And, 
they were fairly primitive, and uh, like I, my reporting technology was uh, the the, girl, the woman who taught the course sold sold uh, uh, licensed music that you could put in the back. You know, it's like if you listen to my hermetic stuff, you've heard. It. Um, and so what I would do is I would take that tape, and I would take another tape, and I used like a karaoke type machine, and I, the, my first, some of my recordings, some of the new hermetics recordings, not all of them, but some of them are recorded that way. Um, and so, I mean, just really primitive stuff, you know, and they came out pretty well. There's, there's a few little errors here and there in some of them that I've never fixed, but, um, so I recently remastered all that crap, and at the same time, I added my different frequencies of binaural beats to the background of all of them, so that my entire site is one, like any recording that you get from my site is integrated with all the other recordings so that if you listen to one recording, you're going to be getting an imprint at a certain level and if you listen to another recording with the same thing, you're going to be getting that imprint plus the other imprint so that it's all this like sort of um, tapestry of, of, uh, of interrelated associations that are going on and uh, it's, it's really amazing. and, and um, for a long time, I've been doing this thing where I had these um, seasonal recordings for the equinoxes and the solstices, uh, where I have people all over the world uh, doing these these meditations. This year, for the first time ever, I charged three dollars for them, and uh, much, many less people downloaded them than usual, which was, which was interesting. I, mean, I used to give them away for free. You know, actually on my site up until a few months ago, they were just free whenever you wanted. It was just nothing; it cost nothing. Just I, I used to have about. Um, about 50 recordings on my site that you could just download for free. And I have this friend um, whose uh, name is uh, Dr. Steve G. Jones. Do you guys, have anyone ever heard of him? That's no, interesting. Most rooms, someone's heard of him. He's a hypnotist. He, uh, and he, he was like, you give away 50 things on your site? You're insane. Like, you know, you, you give away one thing on your site, and the only reason you give that away is if they give you your email address, because otherwise you're not, you're, not, you're not connecting with people, you know, you're not making anything grow. So, for the past, like, 15 years or whatever, I've been doing it wrong, which is, uh, <laughs> um, although I've definitely had some people recently, because about, I don't know, do you remember what, it was, I think it was April, I, I, I changed, I started changing everything around, and I've had a number of people write to me recently going, you know, Jason, I love your work, but why do you seem like a new age snake oil salesman charlatan on your website? And you know, so I'm like, you just can't win either way. I mean, no matter what you do, if you're giving it away, people say you're stupid. If you're if you if you're not, they say you're a charlatan. So whatever, I'm just gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> however it goes down. So um, the I wrote New Hermetics, and I started teaching that course. And I and then I started writing a book called The Book of Magic Power. Go ahead. So what's your website again? Just so oh, JasonAugustusNewcomb.com. Um, uh, yeah, <coughs> not promoting myself. Well, um, <laughs> but so yeah, um, the uh, I started writing a book called The Book of Magic Power, and a, a number of my recordings, my more recent recordings that I've done, are actually based on things in that book. So I actually have a lot of those book. Those those are recordings. They're not as organized as the New Hermetics recordings, but, um, and, and I, I wrote that book and I sold it to Red Wheel Wiser, because they had, a, in my contract there was a writer that, that they got to have first look at anything else that I created, you know, and they kept doing that for every book that I did. And I was like, all right, whatever, you know. Um, and so they bought that book from me, and um, then, I, then I wrote to them and I said, I've got this other thing called sexual sorcery that I'm working on, and they said, can we, we're going to take Book of Magic Power, we're going to put it, you know, two seasons from now, we want you to do this sexual sorcery book um, first, because that sounds like you're going to make a lot of money with that. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so I actually moved to Florida right at that time, and I met my wife, and we did a bunch of sex magic and, and created that book. Um, but, <laughs> but no, I, I created the book, she just did the sex. Um, she just did stuff. <laughs> um, so um, that book ended up being my least successful book, strangely enough. And um, they, they, it, I mean, it sold so few copies. And again, I, I, not to be too mean, but I kind of feel like it was their fault. If you ever look at the cover of that book, you can't even. It's just, it's like a light blue book with a with like purple writing on it or something, and it's so. 
it, you can't even tell what it's about. It actually is a couple interlocked in some sort of embrace, but it's so muted in the background that you have to be told that before you can even realize that that's what's going on in it. Donald Weiser actually, I, I met him at a book event when that book was coming out, and he goes, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it's a book about sex magic. He's like, this is about sex magic? And I'm like, yeah, I know, I don't know, I don't know what to do. Um, but he didn't have anything to do with the company at that point, so. Um, that book didn't do well, and they actually ended up going, we're not going to bother publishing the book of Magic Power. You're, you're released from your contract with it. And I was Did like, you get feedback why the book didn't do well? Is that, that book no, I mean, no? The, way, the way publishing works is they just, they make a catalog, and they put it, they make a website, and they send the catalog out to all their subscribers to their catalog. Uh, they, might, they might do some press releases for certain books. And then that's all they do. Nothing else. They don't promote it. Now, for, for my part, I was too involved with my girlfriend who then became pregnant, um, which is something I didn't mention in sexual sorcery. You can make people pregnant when you're doing sex magic. So, <laughs> um, something to keep in mind. I didn't. It's not mentioned at all. The the concept of sex as something that actually reproduces well, babies is, is not mentioned in there. <laughs> so anyway, um, very foolish. And, and I, and I uh, my beautiful daughter Aurora is a result of all that. Um, so uh, <laughs> that book, um, I, I I didn't get out there and promote it. Really. You know, I didn't, I didn't do what I needed to do because I was involved in my relationship and a uh, young, young daughter by the time it came out. And so I, I, I have to take some responsibility for it. I also think that, that it may be somewhat exaggerated how interested your average Joe Public is in sex magic. Um, people like sex. Yes. People like magic. Only some people like sex magic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, because the two people making love is magic anyway. Right. And you're getting a um, vibe from another person's body. And so with all the... I, I just find that very interesting because it's, it's magic unless somebody's got this stigmatism on the word magic, um, on what they think is magic. Because it is a magical... Um, you're doing something very magical with somebody. And yet, all the pornography we have out there, sure. which is the, which is millions and millions and millions of dollars, and yet you have a book on, on, a beautiful. Uh, I haven't read it, but it's a beautiful way of experimenting where you might get more passion and more feeling out of it. Yeah. I find that very interesting. It's a book. It 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 talks about sort of the history of of, of sexual magic going back to the supposed sexual magic that people were doing, and early Gnostics were doing, and, and um, into the European period, and, and, um, and, and discusses sort of the major players in sex magic, which are the great rite of witchcraft, the, um, the uh, Pascal Beverly Randolph, mm -hmm. uh, Hermetic Brotherhood of uh, Light, Luxor. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Aleister Crowley uh, and the OTO, and, you know, the pre-Crowley OTO, and, and, and uh, which, which actually, uh, the pre-Crowley OTO had its attitude towards sex magic was that, in fact, Jesus was teaching se a sexual Eucharist, and that's hidden, and you know, that's the secret mm -hmm. that the priests uh, keep to themselves. Strangely, I had a, I met a guy who was an ex-priest, and he said that that was true. So. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You, you can you can maybe answer that better than I can. But um, so uh, it then goes into again practically modeling what people who are successful with those things do, and and it gives sort of specific exercises and. Uh, so like it's all, well, with any book you wrote, it's, it's all about the open mind anyway. Yeah. And how people interpret certain things and if, you know, what they have had in their mind all their whole life growing up, it may be just this little 
square and that's it. Anything out of the out of the ordinary is just frightening. Well, certainly yeah. that that is that is with a, any book with any writing of something different, non traditional. Well, probably. sex definitely has its taboo aspects, even within the occult community. Um, and um, I, you know, whatever it didn't it didn't do well. They, that that was the point I was trying to get. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, so I, I got the rights back for the Book of Magic Power, and at first I was kind of sad about it. And, and then I was like, you know, um, self-publishing is easier now. There's all these things on the internet to make it happen. And so uh, I published the Book of Magic Power myself. And I have to tell you, um, from a purely commercial standpoint, I have made probably a hundred times more money from the Book of Magic Power than I have than I ever will from any of the books that I did in major publishing now. Um, the uh, had I not had those ones that were published by a, a fairly reputable publisher, at least at that time, I don't know whether I would have have sold as many of the Book of Magic Power. But for me, the I, I it it would be very strange if you were to ever see something coming out from a major publisher from me again. Just just uh, I was talking to that guy Steve G. Jones, and he. He was trying to, I think it was Harper Collins. They basically told him that he needed to come to the table with $60,000 in marketing money or they weren't interested in working with him on his book. So, I mean, it's, you know, now he, he's, he's operating at a slightly higher level than I am and they're wanting to, to go wider than, than anyone was envisioning for me. But so, I mean, publishing has really gotten pretty weird at this point. Uh, these little tiny publishers that publish our occult stuff are probably, you know, a lot nicer <laughs> than, than most of the, the big stuff. So, um, I've continued since that time period to kind of hone what it is that I, that I have to offer, both for myself and for others. Um, and so, my recordings on my site and my, the things that I make are really things that I, that I believe will help people to kind of achieve their magical goals in um, the easiest way possible. Uh, not everybody's into that from me. <laughs> some people like things to be hard, first of all, and second of all, some people just, you know, they just don't, they're not into what I do, so it's fine. Uh, but that's that's kind of been my goal. So, like my my incense and stuff. That's that's all stuff that I developed for myself, and that I have decided to share because I feel like it's something that's valuable. Um, now, my attitude towards it is like I, I use the ingredients that are most frequently cited as being the ones that are that are for the planets um, and the elements. Um, but I don't do that necessarily because I feel like those ingredients are inherently better than, than other ingredients. I do it because those are the ingredients that when I combine them together and the way that I combine them together created a, a smell result for me that made me feel like, yeah, that's, that's solar. Yeah, that's lunar. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Marshall. And it's kind of, you know, a little more pungent. Oh, that's that's definitely Saturn. It's got a bitter kind of, you know, like so. I mean, I, I my my work is more about the practical, like how can I evoke those feelings with what it is that I'm doing. I think a lot of a lot of people, their attitude towards the components of their ritual is more more how can I align it with the the cosmic correctness, and I think that's fine. I try and do that as much as possible. But if, if there's a practical reason to do something else, I tend to go in that direction just because I feel like ultimately, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna make changes, excuse me, if we're gonna make changes in the universe with our actions, obviously we need to be paying attention to what the universe is doing, right? I mean, you know, if we're not, then that's you're not you're not doing anything. <laughs> you know, if the universe is going this way and you're going this way, you're you're just gonna get pulled along. Um, but if we wanted to make changes, the universe is kind of flowing on its track, and what we're really most interested in is the particular part of the track that we're going to be a part of, and that, that's different for different kinds of settings. You guys were talking about doing sort of a theurgy that's about healing the world. That's obviously very impersonal, and it's very, um, you know, it's about 
but ultimately it's about yourselves too, because hopefully after you do it, you walk out of here and treat people a little better, at least for that day. You know, <laughs> you know, get out and go, ah, screw you! <laughs> that's, that's not, ho hopefully that's not happening. <laughs> um, otherwise, yeah, you might want to consider a different ritual. Um, maybe a more simple ritual. <laughs> um, so, but when you're talking about something like um, you need to increase your income or something, you know, and uh, f first of all, it's very important, I feel like, a lot of people talk, do money magic and they just, they have a job that they do and they just go to that job and then they go home and then they do a money magic spell and what, are they hoping that their aunt is going to die and give them, like, where, where is that money coming from? There's no, there's no, uh, there's no uh, pathway, there's no magical link between those things. So, um, what's important for me in doing practical magic is that there is a logical through line between what it is that I'm trying to accomplish and what it is that, that needs to happen. And so for me, the most important stuff is really inside of me and the direction that I'm going. I want the universe to be aligned, but then I want to make sure that I'm on the right sort of page for making it happen. And those are really the ingredients that have to be there in order to make things happen on a practical level, as far as I've noticed in, in ritual. When I, when I do something pie in the sky that I have no um, thread of connection with, my results are scattered. But when I, when I do something that, you know, um, it, it, you, you need to have this thing happen, um, I actually do, I will, I don't tend to, I don't want, I don't, I, this is not a pitch for me to do ritual for you guys, I know you guys are all accomplished magicians, but, but I do have some people that have come to me as a, a professional occultist, and I will say no, unless I feel like there's a good chance it's going to happen even without whatever it is I'm going to do, Be just because I don't, I don't want that, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to, you know, work on something like that at all. Um, I, I had an interesting experience. Uh, I, I was working at a New Age store doing tarot readings, and um, one of the things when they first hired me was like, "Are you available for house cleansings?" And uh, I guess that's something they were occasionally asked for. And I said, "Sure, whatever. I'm an occultist. I can I can do that kind of thing, right?" Um, so I got a call, <laughs> and it was from this from this woman and her husband, and the woman was freaking out. I think, personally, that she was having some sort of um, psychological... Uh, Break. But yeah. Because, um, now, the one thing about, I went to the house, and I brought some stuff, and I did some ritual for them. Um, but when I looked out their back, to their, to the, to their, behind their house, it had been really clear-cut, like someone had just they told me that some, the, the project had started there, and then it, they, they ran out of money when the economy collapsed, you know? Um, and so it was just this completely desolate, it had been completely stripped of everything, and it went out way, 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 way out. And it felt like there was like a, like an almost oppressive flow of stuff coming towards the house. And so I thought, you know, this is, I think this lady is crazy, but I also think this, this is going on too, you know. Because what she was saying is that she was like, do you see how there's like, it's like there's this opening right here. It's like, and, and it was even worse in the middle, of, you know, and she's just, there, there, she was having, you know, real strong visual experiences of something, you know, pretty bizarre. Um, that was like in the middle, like just it was in random places in the house. It didn't it, there? There seemed to be no sort of order to what was happening. So I did the ritual. But what, what was funny about it is I called up a week later to ask if um, if you know if they, if how they were doing, and the woman was seemed much better. And um, I was like, oh, so it worked. And she's like, well, I don't know if what she did worked. Um, and it turns out she. I was the fifth person who'd come in, who yeah. <laughs> she hired, and the one right after me was the one that she thought did it. Um, and what was interesting is that she was Hispanic, and he was like a, a Santero, and I think she, like whatever his thing that he was doing, it fit with what she was feeling, you know? Um, and that, somehow that like brought her back to, to ground in this. Uh, so, I, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that 
when we when we set out to do something, our perceptual framework of it inside of ourselves is almost as important as anything else. Does that make sense to you guys? Uh, I feel like I've been rambling for a really long time. Do you guys want? Do, can we open this up to Q and A for a little bit? Yeah, I do have a question. Something that you hit on a minute ago. So it sounds like you were working more with groups. You were in the OTO. Uh huh. And now your focus is to to sort of maybe I'm misrepresenting it, but you're creating tools for people to use uh -huh. for their individual practice. Do you think that's reflective of a larger, like almost a change in epic that we're going through, where we're moving from the you know the Piscean to the Aquarian, if you want I mean, to label it that way? To an extent, uh, absolutely. I, I had a cup of water that I'd like to find or bottle. Grab your bottle of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll grab one for you. Thirsty. Been rambling for so long. <laughs> um, I do think that it probably does have something to do with that. I think it has to do with the fact that um, in this in this era uh, we we are more separate from one another. It's nice that you guys you have actually a fairly large group here, um, you know, uh, working together. And I'm assuming that there's a couple more that aren't here for whatever reasons. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive in some ways. Because uh, I think a lot of groups, I mean, I don't know where the OTO here is now, but I would say our, when I was in the OTO, our working group was maybe two thirds of where you guys are right now. Uh, you know, with, we had, thank you, we, we collected members that never came. You know, that, that, the OTO didn't, we didn't have a, um, a, a, a like ritual. A base ritual that you did every. Season. Yeah, okay. I mean there there is that frame ritual of the um, the Gnostic mass, but our particular group didn't really do that regularly, so um, we didn't have that coming together. So we were very focused on initiations. So we would, you know, people would come through and get initiated, and then we'd never see them again, um, or just one or two more times, a lot, you know. So we had we had a. Pretty solid body of, uh, of so initiatives. Organization. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Happens a lot in masonry. Yeah. Yeah. People just come through and get the ring. You know. Well, that's. I mean, masonry and, and, and OTO are similar yeah. in that they're really Very focused similar. on yep. the initiations. You know. So, I do think that there are more practitioners that are that are going it alone. Um, I do think that. Um, there's a, there's a lot of uh, desire for customization in, um, in, in our current <laughs> worldview, and I think that you know, when, you, when you want things to be the way that you want them to be, it's much easier not to work with others because they're not, gonna, you know, they're not yeah. necessarily going to agree. Can you tell us, talk to us a little bit about what you feel works well with a group and well within, with an individual? Because I, I get the sense that there are some acts of theurgy or thaumaturgy that are designed or that are ideal for working with a group and there are others that are ide more ideally done I mean, as, a, whole, as yeah. a personal, yeah. I think, I think celebratory events like seasonal rituals and stuff like that work extremely well with the group because they, because they, they bring you all together for a purpose, you all share your energy and you, you're, you're aligned and, and even if you guys are getting together weekly or monthly or whatever you're, you're to do a, a, a kind of a celebratory ritual like that, that that's, that's, the, that's the same kind of energy. Those are ideal. I think you get into challenges when you're doing things like, um, I've never, personally, I'm sure it's happened, but I've never seen like a group of people have gotten together for like a prosperity ritual or a love ritual or one of those sorts of things. I've never seen that work out where anyone has anything positive come from it whatsoever. Because ultimately, think about it, if you're getting together into a, a ritual space and you're all going for a, your own individual thing, you're not adding anything to each other and you're just scattering all that energy. So now if you said, we're going to do a ritual for her, we're going to get together and we're all going to do a ritual so that she, you know, finds the man of her dreams or she, 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 oh. she goes to, you know, she, <laughs> she, she gets that promotion that she's hoping to get at work. I think that could be very effective. How did you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a pro, I'm a I professional. Know, I know, I'm a um, so, uh, so that could be very effective because you're, because you're working on one purpose. Uh, I think one of the challenges that comes from the OTO's Gnostic Mass is that it does, for, I mean, I don't know if, has anyone here ever been to an, a Gnostic Mass? 
I think they do them real regularly in Salem. Yeah. You should go check it out. It's interesting. Um, they do not drink blood, although they, do, they say that they are, but just in the same way that all Catholics do. <laughs> um, uh, the, the way that I've seen that conducted more times, the priest and the priestess are doing a magical act with the, the Eucharist. They're creating the, and they're, and they're doing that, but the rest of the room is also doing their own private things. You can, and you can see it, because they're just sort of like, um, you know, and they're all, they're all clearly there for their own holy guardian angel work, or whatever it is that, they, that, they're, that they're planning to get out of the experience. And I feel like there's often a, a fractured sense in a lot of them. See, not every time, but, that's, but I see that a lot in that, in that particular group. Um, and I don't mean that as a disparagement of them at all, uh, but it just, it's just, that, that's something that I've observed. Uh, and that may be true of your group too sometimes, I have no idea. <laughs> I've never watched you and Rachel. You guys did your owns together pretty well, I felt. So, you know, it, for a second it was, it was off and, and then it came into, into sympathy with each other. Uh, so, um, evocation or angelic communication, that can work okay in a group. I think it's almost better with a, just a twosome than a, than a, than more. Uh, the you know the way that I've done it with larger groups than that is that you know you end up taking on roles sort of like a lodge where someone is the incense person and someone's the water person and you know and maybe the maybe the incense person also writes down the results and something like that. Um, but those roles are largely superfluous, and so really don't add that much to the... <laughs> and again, you end up with the possibility of them taking away some of the energy from the experience. So, I mean, for me, I think it's all about what your focus is and where, where your intent is. You know, I, I think anything can be done. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever been a part of a, a ritual that had more than 20 people in it that I felt really the energy could really hold together, you know, all that well. Um, like big rites at pagan festivals, that's just a, <laughs> totally ridiculous most of the time. Rites of spring. You know, yeah, rites of spring. Yeah. That's really nice. yeah. <laughs> I, I've actually seen them develop a great deal of energy, but it's very unfocused. So right. you can get an ecstatic, okay. you really get a sense for what the ecstatic, we experience that. If you a good drum music. circle and the dance around naked, yeah. that's a lot of fun. Or it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, it does, and it does raise your energy in a similar way to our little homes that we were doing, but it doesn't, just like little homes, it's, it's you know, much ado about nothing. Not transformative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the key. It's then what you do with it, that right. it seems to. Right. And I feel like, you know, I've been to a few things where uh, the universe was agreeing with you there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as a Carlos Castaneda reference. Um, uh, I've been to those kinds of experiences where I feel like I did have a transformative experience from it, a catharsis, like, um, like dancing around naked. I remember as a younger man feeling uncomfortable with that idea and intentionally going around naked and, and that was like a, that, you know, it, it was a, a powerful shift in the way that I looked at things and made me feel more comfortable in my skin. Um, so I mean, that's that's a magical act that you can do in a crazy big group. That, but again, you're pulling from the rest of the group to, in order to have your personal transformation happen. Then, because you know whatever you're doing to get more comfortable, whether it's acting out or whether it's being uncomfortable, you know you're you're ultimately affecting things. You're not working in accord with everybody that's there. You're working your own thing. So, um, you know, you mentioned things like um, healing the world. Uh, that, that sort of a, of a group ritual could probably be done in, a, in fairly large numbers if everyone was agreeing that that was the purpose and everyone was working towards that purpose. That, um, I think though that they, that like in, in research on that, that, that there isn't really that much difference between you know, five people meditating and five, five, five you know, like it's not, like the, you can see a change in, in statistics, that, you know, if you look at them right. Uh, <laughs> uh, either way, and it's not like it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, your little group could have an effect on the violence in Boston just as much as, you know, the uh, transcendental meditation group of 5,000 people. You know, it doesn't really matter. Well, why would it matter, ultimately, right? I mean, you're directing the same energy 
why would why would twenty people direct? You know, it, it's one of the weird things. Like, um, you know, the power of prayer is a weird idea. Like, why why would why would you need to ask God to do nice things for you? Like, why would God be just crappy to people who don't ask? You know, <laughs> like it's it's an odd it's an odd conundrum that that comes up. And yet, the power of prayer does sort of make changes in things. And I think it aligns you to the conduit of who you yeah. truly are. I mean, that's the, like, the key thing with prayer. Sure. Yeah. It yeah. opens up the circuit. Well, I mean, for some people. You know. <laughs> depends on their background. Right. It depends on a lot of things, a lot of variables. I mean, so, I don't know if there's a difference between prayer, ritual, meditation. All those things are basically the same thing. It's just different. Different packages. Just different ways of approaching mm -hmm. the same idea. So it sounds like alignment of intention is a very important concept for, you think, for group, the success for yeah. group, and, and also within yourself too. I think you know the more the more that something is absolutely true. You know, I mentioned this in a, in one of my marketing emails recently. Um, you should join my mailing list. I, I, I it's, it's usually a fairly short ramble, but um, uh, Jason, I guess you can come get free recordings. Thanks. <laughs> it's a free recording. Just, just one. Just one. Draw you it's two actually. I, oh. I, I couldn't help but be generous. <laughs> When you, you get more results from almost everything when you make it true for yourself. Um, and I, I, let, let me give you an example of a, a guy who doesn't do this. I, there's this, I, I, he's, he's someone, he's still a student of mine. He's been a student of mine since 2007 or something like that. Um, and he's just, he's, he's one of two people that have never like never quit and never graduate, <laughs> and, you know. And I kind of and I made a commitment to like you know just see people through as long as and you know two people have taken advantage of it forever. So I still speak to him every every few weeks, and uh, he he's a really good visualizer. He can he I mean he, uh, he describes things you know that happen on their own that are quite detailed in his visions, and yet he never accomplishes anything in his life, and he never accomplishes his goals with his visualizations. And the reason is, there's, there's two reasons, I think. Um, one of them is that he, he visualizes it so well that he gives himself the reward of having what it is that he wants to have without having to actually do anything. So, you know, he, he feels good about the experience that he just created in the ether, and so it doesn't have to manifest on Earth yeah. because it's, he's already given himself that reward. And the other thing is that I, he, he doesn't he doesn't make it about it happening on Earth. You know, he doesn't make it about that. It's about the vision, and it's very clear when you listen to his language that that's what he's. You know, he he he's he's got the visionary space, and then he's got his world, and they're two separate things. Until you make what you're envisioning intentionally connected with your with your physical world, there's really no reason for the two to come together. What do you suggest as a grounding technique then? Just simply making it true. Just, just this is this is my this is the truth that I'm creating for myself. Is this is this experience, you know? And it's going to it's going to come through. Um, there's a guy Maxwell Maltz, I think his name is, uh, psych, psycho cybernetics. His per, his proposition was that all you have to do is sit in a room quietly and think about what what you want to have happen in your life, and eventually it'll it'll manifest for you. Well, this guy who I'm talking about. Can just sit there and think about it, and not ever have it connect with the world. So Does he understand that's happening. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm hoping that, that I'm getting. I mean, we've talked about it a lot, so yeah. I'm hoping he's starting to. And is he okay with that right now? Does what? he seem to be satisfied with the way it's working for him right now? Uh, which that which he's part? Visualizing it, but he loves else? he loves the visuals. Really? You know, that's yeah. something that he really yeah. enjoys. Yeah. He, you know, he's a person. I guess I'm not going to be able to release this part of this recording, but uh, <laughs> he's a person who he lives with his mom, and you know, he used to live out away from his mom, but he lost his job and he moved back in with his mom, and he just basically doesn't have any responsibilities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So okay. there's, it's you know, he's well, living sort of that like lotus eaters, you know, that you know he doesn't have he doesn't have to accomplish right. anything. So why would he? Interesting. Um, and, it, and it sounds also if he's hooked on the visualization that it's also yeah, yes, and if yeah. you and if you manifest it it ends the 
the prospect it ends with of responsibility. Oh, it, also, it, yeah, it ends our relationship, right. but it, <laughs> and it also it ends the visualization which he's enjoying. So it actually right. he's got a perverse incentive to not have it manifest. For sure. I mean, I mean, uh, go, go into the thing that makes the worlds. What was that called? What's the holodeck? Yeah, yeah, the holodeck. It's like a holodeck. Like the holodeck. Right. Right. Well, in, in the trance state. Um, can be very like a drug, you know. You you're yeah. you're you much less feeling attached into your body. Mm -hmm. There's this the blissful energy flowing through you. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to lead anywhere for it to be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually realized that in some ways that I, I and this is one thing we were talking about how I've changed. I, I don't necessarily agree with myself all the time. We were talking at lunch about that. Um, I think really deep trance states, except for very specific things like having out of body experiences and like that, are actually somewhat detrimental to um, your uh, your magical work. And I really was a big proponent of the other way around for a long time in my life. And you know, to the point, you know, other people are like, you know, oh no, that's that's not you. Know, you don't want to be in a deep trance state. And I would say, yes, you do. The deeper, the better. You know, like. Yeah, but in neurolinguistic programming, uh, one of the concepts people are in a trance state most right. of the time, and they're so heavily influenced by things they don't even necessarily want to be influenced right. by. So that's. And and the facts yeah. are, there's not a single aspect of visualization or, or vision, envisioning things, experiencing higher worlds that really has anything to do with being out of it in any way. You, you can totally be in feeling in your absolute normal state of consciousness and have just as much success with that stuff as if you were in a very, very, you know, if you were sleeping and having a dream. There's no, our, our minds are very malleable. If you just, if you just take uh, the, the steps in the right way, you can get to exactly the same place without having to be really sleepy. I used to feel like, you know, if I'm not like, Peter on the edge of sleep, I'm not going to experience the angels as vividly. You know, it's just not going to happen. And that's not, that's simply not the case. So um, being focused. What's that? Being focused. It's focused it, intent. It's, I, uh, we're getting into tonight's lecture, but yeah, it's, it's, it's limiting your attention to the, what, what it is that you're intending to experience and removing your critical factor, removing your um, your tendency to delete things or to challenge uh, experiences. One of, I mean, one of the biggest problems that we have in uh, in almost anything that we do, um, but subtle things are even more so. We have the tendency to kind of like, am I doing this right? Am I? Is this is this the correct way of doing it? Is this the? And the, meaning, <laughs> the moment you start getting into that space, you're standing in the way of the experience. You're you're ending it essentially at that moment, and so. One of the easiest ways of getting both of those things to happen is to really deeply relax your body and you know just stop thinking as much as possible, and you can and you can have that kind of experience happen. But then you're then you're largely out of control, <laughs> and you have to have someone kind of guiding the experience for you to a large extent. But all that is totally unnecessary, realistically. Keep a diary. I mean, that's definitely a way of doing it over time, for sure. Plus, well, another grounding technique, too, if you're having problems manifesting. Yeah. You visualize something, you write it down, you're solving my, it. My, my, my young Padawan, he writes obsessively. He can write, he can write 100 pages a day <laughs> about, about the stuff that's going on. Every detail of every vision, that he, you know, but still does not, you know. I actually had another student who had, a, an, I think, an even more serious problem. Which is uh, what I call repetitive um, activity uh, <laughs> difficulty. Which is like he he was very interested in energy and manifesting money for himself. Those were his two main focuses. Um, so he learned to practice. Um, he was Italian, so he and spoke fluent, fairly fluent English. So he had all of our English stuff and then all of the Italian stuff too. Okay, so and that doubles the amount of different kinds of occult things that you can explore, right? So he, he had a, a, a morning ritual that took him about four hours to do that was all these different forms of energy work to heal himself and then manifestation work to get the money that he wanted. I mean, it was, and I was like, just 
stop doing that and go get a job. And a girlfriend. Um, <laughs> your energy. Um, so, but, you know, I mean, and the crazy thing about it is he was like, well, okay, the first one, it's really focused on energy in this way. And you have to swirl the energy up at the top of your head and then bring it down into your heart chakra and then put it down into your base chakra, then put it down through your legs into the ground. And the other one, you begin at your heart chakra and you start spinning at the heart chakra and you raise the energy up to your, to your, uh, your crown chakra and you spread it out into the universe that way and the fourth one you begin with the I mean like he just it, 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 all, all the practices were redundant with each other and what they were actually doing with different orders and different like you know this one you had to picture this symbol in the middle and this one you had to picture this but but essentially it's the same practice other than the symbol it just you know it's just it's too much stuff it's not at a certain point, it's about, like the other guy, it's just about the experience of doing it rather than any result that you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And you're wasting half your life on, mm -hmm. on uh, <laughs> you know, doing this. Wow. Not, that, not that, you know, spiritual practice is a waste of time necessarily, but just, it, In uh, uh, especially if you are so mono-focused on just a couple of things, and they're both selfish things. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, you heard the, the story of the, the guy who prayed all of his life to win the lottery, and he's like praying, yeah. and praying, and praying, and finally goes up to God, and he's like, "Oh God, I just I prayed all my life to win the lottery." He's like, "You never bought a lottery ticket." Right. Yeah. No, I, like, I felt that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that I think is a that little tale is a perfect example of what you were saying about creating conduits. Yeah. If you you don't create a pathway for your thing to manifest. Sure. I mean, that's kind of a still, I think yours get a job is probably even more accurate. Well, if you want to study music and become a great musician, practice. Buy an instrument, buy take an some instrument. lessons, right. you know, kind of, you know, understand a right. bit. Yeah, and, and, and they're, they're, all of us, in our own way, stand in our own way with some of that stuff. Everyone, none, none of us are free from that's that. True. It's just, it's at different levels, maybe, or different, you know, areas of our lives, but that it's so easy to not create the the one simple step that you need to have in order to make things work out for you. Um, you know, so often it's just asking or, you know, letting people know, like I forgot to give people my website, how am I gonna, how am I gonna get you to buy recordings from me if you don't have my website? So. Well, we'll circulate both your website addresses to our <laughs> so, right. so, so. Um, um, Quick question, you were talking a little bit before about people who tend to want to do like the intro ritual. Yeah. And then stop. Why do you, why do you think why do you think that well, is? is to a certain extent, there, you know, I don't want to criticize people who do a specific ritual every day because I think that you know people can sit down and do but vipassana I, I every think day. That's a very, I think it's a very universal phenomenon, though. That I've seen it a yeah. lot of a lot of it, places. But yeah, and and I think honestly that doing the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram or some some related to it can be a very transformative spiritual thing to do. Um, if, if you are constantly building, if, if every single time that you approach it, you are saying, how can I more deeply connect with these, these energies and these, and these you know, things that, we're, that I'm trying to connect with, you can actually just do that and have it be something that is a powerful, spiritual, transformative practice. I don't want to say that, I'm not trying to criticize people to do that, but I think that the reason that most people do do it is not that, it is that they feel like they are not ready to do the next thing, and so they just want to stick with something that seems safe and comfortable that they know others have done and not gotten into too much trouble. So that they're, um, what and it's laziness? for a million. What laziness? <laughs> Mental laziness. Yeah, yeah laziness. I think creeps in a lot. Well, yeah. Self doubt. Right. Like you're saying, when you start thinking about something, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? right? This? Well, okay, are you doing it 100 percent right? Maybe. If not, keep moving on. Move on to something right. else. Moving it's on. cumulative. Yeah, exactly. It's going to build up, and a lot of people get very much caught up into the. the I think. I think too. Uh, both of what you're saying is correct. I think that there that there's like kind of a, a, a big chasm between, you know. Little Jason, at 13 years old, who wanted to cast spells on his neighbors, and <laughs> and the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. There's a big there's a big space between there that's filled with an indeterminate amount of knowledge and, and wisdom and whatever. Uh, so when you stand here, knowing the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, knowing that it's a thing that people do, and you know that what you really want to do is this very advanced thing. 
that maybe isn't even possible. Um, it's easier to just sit there rather than go on the dangerous and precarious adventure between those two points, you know? It's, it, because, I mean, I'm sure you've all had the experience of having a ritual intention, doing a ritual of some sort, and feeling really empty that it didn't, you didn't, it didn't feel like you were doing anything magical enough, and it just was sort of like, that sucked, and I, I suck, and I should <laughs> give up this crap, I'm an idiot. Like that, that is, I think anyone who, is, who has gone beyond the lesser fantasy ritual of the pentagram has that experience at some point fairly early on. And it's kind of hard to, you know, pick up your, you know, dust your knees off and, and, and keep going after that, because you're like, well, I mean, that really wasn't very effective. I didn't get what I wanted out of it. Although I've actually had the experience of having a ritual that seemed terrible, and I, I thought, I was, you know, I, I, I don't even know what I, what I was thinking. And then, lo and behold, the thing that I wanted to happen happened. So, you know, in a practical sense, you can have things work that you, you know, don't even necessarily realize that are they're going to. Or it seems like they couldn't because of how bad it was. <laughs> Like all your candles spilling over onto the table, or you know, it's just you know terrible things, and then you know, lo and behold, your intention was yeah. I've had I've had uh, altars go up on on flames like four times. <laughs> Robes catch on fire. Grab Robes catch on fire. I've never had that one happen. I've knocked over candles onto the floor a number of times with it. Like, what, why do we have robes that have these long, like, what, what, what's the thinking of that? seems like bad. It's like the floor. It's a bad idea. It's fashionable. Yes. 13th century uh, couture at its finest. But uh, it seems a little impractical with a bunch of candles. Um, or even two. So, did I answer that question? Or was I just, yeah. No. Just, yeah. It was a relatively open question. When you're... To have like a certain conduit to ground what you're doing, uh -huh. is it wise to try and just focus on that one conduit, or is it better, or is are you just you're you're saying you're, you're, you're saying a magical link, like, the pathway yeah. to it, like sh just one job. That's the only. Here's yeah, the like thing: just focus on one thing, or would that be getting into your own way of? I recommend energy. having a slightly open-ended attitude towards it, but have a particular agenda in mind. Let's say, let's say we're talking about getting a, a promotion at work, okay? Um, obviously in that case, you really only have one choice that you can think of, right? Which is that promotion. Mm -hmm. However, if you are focused on, on getting what you want and have a slightly open attitude towards it, when you find $100 on the ground or you get a job offer from a different company or um, you get a, your friend gives you a scratcher and you and you win thirty dollars, or you find a nickel on the ground. All of those things should be considered to be on some level a success at increasing your prosperity, because what that does is it opens yourself up to making transformations happen in your life. So, um, does, does that sound like a reasonable answer to you? Uh, I, I found, I, I had a magical teacher, uh, I think he's still alive, who, I, he was like, I, I went and visited him and, and I was like, I, I, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting about like 75, 80% of what I, what I try and do practically. And he was a very practically focused guy. And, and he goes, that's terrible. I'm like 90, 95% successful. You're terrible. And I'm like, um, well, what do you mean? And, and so then I started observing what he was considering to be successes, and anything that was at all remotely connected with his result, he considered a success. So he was almost always successful. There was almost no failure for him. Mm -hmm. And I think that he actually managed to accomplish a lot of stuff that he probably wouldn't have had he not had that attitude. Mm -hmm. And that's a great attitude for life in general. You know, like, I can always... I'm always going to succeed at everything that I do. That's a great way to sort of walk around in life, just in general, outside of ritual. <laughs>